Bienvenue, good morning. What a great and glorious day to be the people of the American Cathedral in Paris. So much happening, so much wonderful thing. The church is full of angels and shepherds and, and all sorts and choirs. And uh, we begin by hearing the word today through the telling of the Posada story powerful story at a time where there are 105 million refugees on the planet, the story of the refugee f holy family trying to find space in the inn. We have, as our preacher this morning, and are blessed by the presence of uh, Canon Kelly Brown Douglas. After the service, and let me tell you as a lover of Mexican food and Mexican culture, I'm so excited. Come to the parish hall afterwards. We have a piñata, great, wonderful Mexican food and Latin American music and wonderful things. And so we're all welcome to continue the celebration from here in the parish hall after. And so grateful to the many who have made today uh, happen from uh, top to bottom. I'm taking just a moment because I'm calling an audible to uh, the acolytes. I don't think we have, and have someone who's lighting the Advent wreath this morning. So when you all arrive, we make sure that the Advent wreath gets lit. So, whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on the journey, know that here is where you belong, just as you are to receive these, the blessings of God, so freely given. And to those who are joining us through uh, the outreach of this online ministry, if you're with us in this moment or later, know that we feel your presence here and you are just a part of this, much as part of this community is all who have gathered here. Let us rise. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
our God and Savior now draws near. Almighty God, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Hence the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and with great might come among us, because we are sorely hindered by our sins. Let your bountiful grace and mercy speedily help and deliver us through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a young woman engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Her name was Mary. Greeting, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God and you will conceive and you will warm and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. His reign will have no end. How can this be? The power of the Most High, uh, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. For God, nothing is impossible. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. His mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation. I am a righteous man, 
so I will not embarrass Mary. But she is pregnant by another, so I will not marry her. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he said, I will do as the angel of the Lord has commanded. I will take Mary as my wife. days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Gal Nazareth to Galilee and to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. Joseph and Mary went in, surf, went in search of safe lodging.
region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds went with haste and found Mary and Joseph, and the child lying in, lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known that what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed. But Mary treasured all these words and pottered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. We remember the journey that your mother took as she and Joseph searched for lodging, a warm, safe place where she could give birth to you. We know that in the world there are men, women, and children who are making exhausting or dangerous journeys. Men, women, and children that are searching for lodging. We pray, we pray that, that doors will be open to them. We pray that we all open our hearts to them. In Christ's name, amen. I think uh, it was the best Christmas pageant ever, and we should show our appreciation. Joseph, can you give us that line one more time, that last line? That 
peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. Bonjour, bienvenue à la cathédrale américaine épiscopale de Paris. Good morning and welcome once again to the American Cathedral in Paris. It is so nice to see this nave so full on a very appropriate day to be here in church with so much to be grateful for. There's so much abundance of this holy season that we are in. First and foremost, as just presented by uh, our youngest siblings in Christ, this powerful story that we have of the arrival of the Holy Family, receiving answers again and again of no, and then ultimately yes. The theme of this season that we are living through and the season that we are living through not only in our church year, but in our world. A huge thank you to our children, a tremendous thank you to parents for supporting this effort in all sorts of ways but we would not have it without you, without your investment and your support. And we would not have it without three special people who help plan and organize this as volunteers. Would Elizabeth Defy, uh, Angelina Blundell, and Hope Newhouse please come forward? I hope that you're in the house. These three did tremendous work in making all of this possible, and so we have just the smallest token of thanks that we can offer for the three of you, but we hope we'll bring you some warmth, uh, especially in the week ahead. So blessings and thank you all. The festivity of this Posadas tradition that comes to us through our Mexican and Latin American siblings continues following the service in the parish hall. We have two incredibly dedicated volunteers, Antonio Merino and Lynette Quintana, who have prepared a feast for us, an absolute feast to which everyone is welcome in food, in music. For all of our Sunday school children who participated in this pageant, there is a piñata, so be sure to stay and be a part of that. If you would like and are able to join us, and we hope that you are, when the service finishes, because especially because it is so chilly out today, we encourage you to exit through this door in the side chapel, which will take you straight into the parish hall. We'll have a priest there to greet you as well as in the back if you're not able to join us afterwards, but we very much hope that you will. You'll see on the back of your bulletin some important announcements that we have, including even following the Posadas, there will be a Messiah sing-along here in this space today at 3 p.m., led by the Paris Choral Society. Um, and then next Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, will be our annual observance of Christmas lessons and carols. Saturday at 4, Sunday at 6. Note, uh, as we might have lost track of, that the World Cup final is scheduled for 4 p.m. on Sunday. Our service is at 6, so plan accordingly if you plan to join us on Sunday. Or plan for Saturday if you're planning to watch. Uh, all right, and most importantly for this morning, actually, with so many guests here, I just want to say one thing about, in a little bit, we're going to turn our attention to this table behind us. Everyone is welcome to take part in the bread and wine that will be made holy if you are joining us 
for the first time or the first couple times know that absolutely everyone is welcome, no matter where you come from, no matter what you look like, no matter what you believe or struggle to believe, who you love, how you love, this is your feast. This is our family feast. Please come forward. We will serve at the altar rail. If you simply wish to receive a blessing, you can cross your arms if you would just like that. We will have a station on the floor as well if coming up these stairs presents a challenge to you today. We are delighted, absolutely delighted, to have the Reverend Canon Kelly Brown Douglas to be our guest preacher this morning. She is the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Seminary in New York City. She is also Canon Theologian to Washington National Cathedral. Her most recent book, Resurrection Hope, has received many accolades, including this very weekend a prestigious award, the Grauemeyer Award for 2023, which is a great accomplishment. We are delighted to have you here, and we are excited for you to break open the good news for us in this Advent season this morning. An abundance of gifts. Bienvenue, welcome. We hope that you will make this your feast day in the midst of Advent this Sunday.
Good morning. Before I begin, let me first thank Ken and Greg Garrett for making this invitation possible on this morning. Thank Ken and Kat for his warm welcome and most especially the Dean of this cathedral, Dean Safford. Thank you so much for sharing your pulpit, sharing this cathedral and this congregation and I thank all of you. But I would be remiss not to thank the young people for such a wonderful pageant and they preached the sermon for this morning so I am hopefully going to do what you did some justice. But let us pray. Almighty God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our salvation. Amen. And so they came. A very expectant Mary and Joseph across a rough 90 miles terrain from Nazareth to Bethlehem, traveling, we can assume, by foot and perhaps by donkey, to fulfill a census registration enacted by a totalitarian ruler who was imposing a tax to secure his empire and his privileges of power. And so they came, these two poor peasants that were Mary and Joseph, made it to Bethlehem, weary and worn, strangers looking for a place to lay their heads, looking for a place for Mary to give birth, looking for a place of welcome. And they found none. There was no room for them in the end but that this was only a story from long ago. Unfortunately, it is not, for it is one that repeats itself over and over and over again as it does today. They come they come across the ocean on rickety boats and inflatable and homemade rafts. They come fleeing war, fleeing oppression, fleeing famine. These people who are mostly brown and black come to the shores of the United States. They come to the shores of France, men, women, and children, siblings all looking for a place to lay their head looking for a place of welcome, yet there is no place for these strangers in the ends of our land. They come, they come, and there is no room for, in, for them in the end. They are forced to the manger camps and docks under bridges and tents, and so it goes on and on and on a story that repeats itself with each passing Advent, with each passing Christmas, as if there is no end in sight to this endless loop of a sinful story. It is a story, my friends, that as it repeats itself, it is about not only how we turn our backs on the Mary and Josephs of our world, but how we turn our backs on God's very hopes for God's creation, for God's world, for we, God's people. And so I ask this morning, how do we get out of this story? How do we break this cycle of sin? The answer to this question 
begins, I believe, with God's unconditional love for us. For here's the thing. We can't legislate or litigate or politic or protest our way out of it, and we certainly can't harass or hate our way out of it. God's unconditional love for us indeed loves us out of it. For here is the thing, our God, our God, who was perfect love, has loved us into life and is consistently loving us into loving. Loving us into loving ourselves, loving one another, and loving our God. My friends, Advent is the season of our Christian calendar that reminds us that our God is a God who is always coming, always coming toward us, coming toward us out of love, loving us into loving our way out of this story which indeed alienates us from ourselves, one another, and from God's hope for us. Sounds good, right? But what does that mean? What does that love of God look like that is coming toward us, loving us into loving? What does it look like for us today? This brings us actually to the Posada story that you saw enacted, where after the angel Gabriel tells Mary she is with child, she proclaims what has become known as the Magnificat. Mary's song, as you just heard, performed. Mary's song is at once a song of praise and prophecy that makes clear to us what it means for God to come into this world, loving us, loving us into loving. As Latin American theologian Gustavo Gutierrez says, Mary's song expresses humbly what it means to be loved by God. And so, what does it mean? What does it mean that God comes to us? What is it that Mary's song is telling us? It means first and foremost that God is loving us into being proximate with those the world has deemed unlovable. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, Mary sings. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for God has looked with favor upon God's lowly servant. God has looked with favor upon God's lowly servant. My friends, there were no persons lowlier than women in the first century world that was Mary's. A woman had virtually no existence apart from a man, and in fact, somewhere between the ages of 12 and 14, which was around Mary's age, girls passed from being under the rule of their fathers to the rule of their husbands, husbands chosen, by the way, by their fathers. In Mary's world, for a woman to be without a male guardian in her life was to be without a means to live, which meant a harsh reality, especially for widows. And to be sure, apart from a man, women were without voice, for women were not allowed to speak in public, I think of so many women around the world today. Moreover, women were not permitted to worship or to even enter into the inner sanctum of the temple, that is the place where God was believed to dwell, like the altar or on the sanctuary or at the sanctuary, and certainly not in the pulpit. Yet, this lowly woman who was Mary, who was not even allowed into God's temple is the very one chosen by God to be the bearer of the incarnate love 
that is God. Not to even mention that other lowly woman, Elizabeth, who was chosen by God to bear the forerunner, John, of God's incarnate love. Cathedral, the incarnate love of God that came into our world through Jesus made itself known and present through women, the lowliness of servants. And so it is that the love of God that is always, always coming to us is loving us into being proximate, proximate with the lowly servants of this our world, in this our time, in this our place. That is those people who are too often forgotten, the marginalized, the poor, the ones that are deemed the problems, the ones that are left at the borders of our world in tents or on ships or on steps of museums under bridges, those that are regarded as perhaps the essential laborers but never, never the essential human beings. The point of the matter is that God comes to us, loving us into being proximate with the unloved and unwelcomed in our society, in our world. In that proximity, it begins with bringing to the center of our seeing, the center of our knowing, indeed the center of our living, the very histories, yes, the very experience, yes, the very perspective, yes, but the very stories of the Marys, of the Josephs in our world. For here's the thing to know. When we hear their stories, when we enter into their experiences, when we see the world from their perspective, guess what we might discover? that they have bodies that hurt and need to be healed just like us, that they have hearts that can be broken and shattered and need to be mended just like ours. They have dreams and hopes and desires that indeed can be betrayed and need again to be revived, just like we do. To hear their stories, to enter into their perspective, to see and appreciate their experiences, is to know that they are children of God, just as we are, wanting simply to find a place a world of welcome. What does it mean for God to love us into loving? It means being loved into proximity with the lowly of our world. And it means being pregnant with impossible possibilities. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, said Elizabeth to Mary. How impossible it surely seemed in Mary's first century world that a young girl without a husband would be pregnant and live to proclaim it. For an unwed pregnant woman in Mary's world was subject to being stoned to death, as is the case in many nations in our world today. And how even more impossible would be the thought that this unwed girl would be pregnant with the Christ child. Simply, utterly impossible. Yet that which was impossible by the standards of the world was made possible by God. And so it is the love that God, that comes to us every day through God is a love that is loving us into impossible possibilities. 
loving us into expanding our very imaginations of the kind of love, the kind of justice that is possible in God's world. Cathedral, our God does not play by and is certainly not limited to or controlled by our rules. God is not limited to or controlled or constrained by our judgments, our biases, our norms, or even our thinking when it comes to what is possible for God's world, for God's people. The love of God coming to us is pregnant with impossible possibilities that transcend the laws, customs, and coercions of our society and even the demands of our church. And so it is a love that is loving us into imagining, can you imagine this? A world where the first are last and the last are first, not because there's some reversal of fortunes, but because the first are last, the last are first. Everybody is accepted and respected as the equal, equal, sacred human beings that they are. And this brings us to that last aspect that I would like to speak about today of what it means for God loving us into loving. For Mary said, God has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts, has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God is loving us into parity with our created humanity. Again, this is not a reversal of fortune but it is bringing down the powerful, the uh, entitled, privileged, powerful, as it rises up the unprivileged, powerless, so that they, they become not only equal in God's sight, but equal on our earth, in our society, in our world. The bottom line, is that we are all, each and every one of us, children of God. That we act like it, not so much. Cathedral, there is no one more or less worthy than another of a decent place to live, a safe place to lay their head a secure job to work, enough food to eat, or the means to health and well-being. We are all lovingly created out of the dust of the earth. As my younger sister likes to say, we are all simply just dressed up dirt, created by God as sacred human beings. And so it is that God is loving us loving us into parity with our created selves, which means into parity with one another, so that there is no community, no person, that lords over or subjugates or marginalizes another, no person, no community that is lorded over, subjugated, or marginalized. There are only people who are welcomed and loved as God so loves each and every one of us. And so, how do we get out of this endless, endless story of Mary and Joseph, the poor peasants who fled their land, seeking only to be welcome? We get out of this story by opening ourselves to the God who is always coming, always coming toward us, loving us in 
to loving. Left for us to decide is if we will truly open the ends of our land, the ends of our world, the ends of our hearts to receive the love of God, which loves us into proximity, loves us into impossible possibilities, loves us into parity with, with one another, ourselves, and loves us into loving the very Mary and Josephs at our borders, under our bridges, on our, tour, on our shores. Cathedral here in Paris, may it be so, so that on this time next year, we can say that we are on the road, on the road, to ending the cycle of this sinful, sinful story. May it be so. Amen. To every feast, we are asked to bring a gift. The gifts of this cathedral are so abundant as shown today. Let us remember that our gifts make all of this possible. And let us walk in love as Christ has loved us as we make our offerings to God.
with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, good, a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death, to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of us all. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for the world for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer to you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Speaking the language closest to our hearts, we pray the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power of God. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. body of Christ, the bread of God.
please rise. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And the blessing of Almighty God who has created us, who has redeemed us, and who sustains us in the spirit rest upon us this day and guide us always. Let us now go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 